allow me to present your introduction. Alright, so once again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our beer participants, educators from around the globe. Welcome to our worldwide conference. And this time we have a very um, prestigious guest. We're very honored to have him here in our platform. And allow me to share my screen for his introduction. All right. So our speaker for today uh, published over 500 articles and dozens of scholarly books in the fields of literacy, language acquisition, neurolinguistics, and bilingual education. Many of these publications are available for free download at sdcrashen.com. However, he has no longer write books because as of now, nobody can afford to buy hard copies. But nevertheless, he is the most frequently cited scholar in the field of language education. And he is best known for the comprehension hypothesis, the idea that we do not acquire language by speaking or writing, or by studying grammar rules. We acquire language when we understand what we hear and what we read, when we get comprehensible input. The ability to acquire language in this way does not disappear when we get older. It remains strong our entire lives. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all give him a round of applause, Dr. Stephen Krashen. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'd like to first comment on what you see on your screen. Behind you are empty shelves. If I'm such a hero of reading, why don't I have books on my shelves? Everybody asks that, so I thought I'd tell you. Um, the reason is this. The third president of the United States was Thomas Jefferson, very interesting guy. And he donated his entire, oh, my hair, oh gosh. He donated his entire book collection to the United States Library of Congress uh, after the British uh, destroyed it in the war of, I think, 1812. I don't remember. I was a young man at that time. Um, so I have also donated all of my books, about 6,000. And they're in various libraries here in the Southern California area because people my age are giving away everything. It's time to make things very compact so we can move into smaller places. That's the reason why I still think it's a great idea to read and I still wish I had more books, but it's all on uh, digital these days. I divided my talk into two parts. <clears throat> One is called Secrets of, of Writing. And let me tell you about this part. Um, this is not my work. This is the work of other people. I'm not gonna talk about comprehensible input, acquisition, learning, natural order, all those things that I've worked on for years. Instead, I'm going to report the work of other people who have worked on what we call the composing process. And I owe them a great deal. And my obligation is to tell you what they have found so you can apply it to your life as well. It has made my life not only more productive, it's made it easier and a lot more uh, pleasant. Uh, one of the people I talk about is a guy named Peter Elbow. And I, after quoting him for many years, I finally met him at a meeting where we were both speakers and I was able to shake his hand. In those days, we shook hands. Now we, we don't do that. Uh, and thank him for all his help. And I'm sure you will find it useful as well. Well, I've divided this into secrets and unfortunately, these are still secrets. These are things very few people know about. When I look at writing programs, how they're organized, rarely are these ideas mentioned and they're very important. Secret number one, more writing will not result in better writing form. Mostly in composition classes, we have people write, write, you know, uh, two essays every week, et cetera. That doesn't help. The idea to write with good style, to have beautiful sentences and wonderful syntax and grammar, and good spelling and punctuation that doesn't come from writing practice. It comes from reading. 
So that's another lecture. We're going to put that aside and talk about what writing can actually do for you. And that's secret two. Writing can do a lot. Writing helps us solve problems and writing can make up smarter. That's my major message today. Peter Elbow said it very well, one of the great scholars who worked on this. Meaning is what you end up with, not what you start out with. And the big secret, revision. I spend most of my writing day revising, rewriting, changing. Revision is what we call the core of the composing process. Neil Simon, I'm going to quote scholars and professional writers as well, creative writers, playwrights, etc. And I'll tell you what happens to me when I, I write as well. I do two kinds of writing. I do scholarly writing, as some of you have seen. And, you know, living in Southern California, it's your obligation if you live in the Los Angeles area, you should be involved in show business. And I too have a show business career. It's necessary. You, you go to a restaurant, you order the meal, the waiter says, I'm not really a waiter, I'm an actor. Uh, I've got a script ready, et cetera. So that's Southern California. I too am involved in show business. In the last 10 years, I have written 10 musicals and all of them have been performed. How do you like that? Uh, I write them for my synagogue. My synagogue is a very liberal synagogue. And every, do, every year we do a play based on the holiday of Purim. Uh, and we take you know, the movie and change the plot and tell the Purim story each time. And each time I've done that, it's done very well. And I have to do the composing process to get it done. And I'm very well known in the synagogue. I'm very famous for this in the synagogue. And every year uh, I meet with the cast and I show them the script. The cast are the people in the choir. I sing in the choir in the synagogue. Okay. The reason I sing in the choir is that it gets you ready for the religious service. The cantor in charge of it is very good with that. And every time, and the cast comes from the, uh, from the choir. And every time they say, well, well, what are we going to do at this time? And I don't know. And I have to think of how we come up with new ideas. The research I have applied to my work, I have applied for my career in show business. Okay, my tiny little career in show business. This is the same thing. It works for all kinds of writing. Here is the second of many wonderful comments. So, Neil Simon, mediocre writers write, good writers rewrite. Writing is revision. Writing is doing it again. I hope at the end of this presentation, you will have learned to love revising and changing. Kurt Vonnegut, wonderful novelist. Writing allows even a stupid person to seem halfway intelligent. If only that person will write the same thought over and over again, improving it just a little bit each time, like inflating a blimp with a bicycle pump. Anybody can do it, all it takes is time. This has been so helpful to me. Tiny little changes and gradually you get a better paper. The next one is my favorite because it has saved me many times. When the people in the synagogue say, well, um, well, what are you gonna do at this time? I start writing and I think of this next draft of this next statement by Ernest Hemingway. This is a terrific statement and I'm using Hemingway's language, not mine. Hemingway says, the first draft of anything is shit. Once you understand that, the major writing block disappears. The first draft will not be very good. Don't worry about it. That's the way it's supposed to be. I plan, I make an outline the way you're supposed to. And sometimes I use one system, sometimes I use another system. But now, because I've done this research and read these things, the experts say, I change the plan. The first plan is never the final plan. As you write, you get more ideas. As you write, you find your mistakes. This happens in academic writing. It happens in my show business writing. And it happens in poetry. Here's Robert Frost. I never started a poem whose end I knew. Writing a poem is 
discovery. As you write, you come up with new ideas. Here is the big secret, which I, I'm now name dropping, okay? This is ultimate name dropping. Uh, I shared this with Noam Chomsky. I did a webinar with Noam Chomsky. It was amazing. He is still the true living master. Let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with being wrong. I am wrong all the time, every day, every five minutes when I write, and then you get revision, you make it a little better. When I'm done today, I hope, as I do, you will welcome revision. This is how you get smarter. I'm going to talk now about John Tate. I learned about John Tate from my son and my daughter-in-law. My son and my daughter-in-law are both mathematicians. They met in graduate school at the University of Texas. And one of their professors was John Tate. And someone once asked John, John Tate was, he died recently in his 90s, brilliant mathematician. He had made powerful contributions in algebra, number theory, algebraic geometry, all these things. He was an amazing mathematician. Once, at, once someone asked him, what is your writing day like? He said, well, about half the time, I'm really working hard and not getting anywhere. Does this sound familiar? It's me, all right. 10% of the time making some progress. You guys, this is John Tate, one of the best mathematicians of all time, okay? He makes progress maybe 10% of the time. I hope that makes you feel better. Then most of the time, I'm wondering how I can be so stupid <laughs> most of the time, okay? This is normal. We all go through this, okay? Even smart people struggle and worry about it, okay? The idea is that so many people think the good ideas just come. They just come. Uh, I got a hint of this when I was in secondary school. When I was in secondary school, we had to hand in our competition on our, our compositions on Monday. And I looked over at the student sitting next to me, and there was his paper he was ready to hand in. And he typed it in large print so I could kind of read it. It was beautiful. It looked like these thoughts just came to his mind from the other side, that some wonderful spirit just dictated it and he just wrote it down. And I asked him about it. He suffered the same way I did, the same way you do. He said, you have no idea how many drafts I wrote of this paper. I tried this idea three times in other classes and it didn't work. My room at home, like, like my room, his room, was a mess with papers on the floor. This is true of everybody all the time. Uh, another case is um, Albert Einstein. Uh, there was a book about Albert Einstein, a very good uh, biography written by Hans Ohanian. I found out about it because Hans Ohanian's wife, Susan Ohanian, and I correspond a lot. She's a very important person in, in literacy. And her husband, Hans, is an expert on Einstein, wrote a book about Einstein. And by the way, my son is a mathematician, and he has Hans Ohanian's book on his shelf. It's an interesting coincidence, okay, on physics. Anyway, the book is called Einstein's, Einstein's Mistakes, The Human Failings of Genius. It's all about how Einstein messed up, revised, messed up, revised, messed up, revised. There's one section, my favorite part, where... Einstein wrote a paper, submitted it to a journal. It was published about the theory of relativity, full of formulas. And then the next year, he wrote another paper on the same topic. And he said, last year's paper was wrong. Here's the real solution. The next year, the same thing happened again. He wrote another paper and said, the last two are wrong. He did it four years in a row. This is Albert Einstein, you guys. It happens to them, it happens to us. I wrote, this is my moment of fame. I wrote Hans a note. Uh, they sent me a, a draft of the book because they knew I was interested in Einstein. It's good to have friends like this help you out. Uh, anyway, I wrote him I, and I wrote this note. I said, you made a big mistake. Uh, the book is, should not be Einstein's mistake. The book talks about the process of discovering ideas. It's revision. They encouraged me, I wrote a comment about it and they put it on the back cover, on the paper cover that protects the book. So if you go to a bookstore and you get Hans Ohanian's books, you'll see my comment, isn't that beautiful? So the wondrous and twisted roads that lead to knowledge. 
back in the old days, before we put everything on computer, uh, we used to uh, ask your parents about this. They'll tell you what we used to do is we would make copies of our papers and we put them on mimeograph and make copies and share them with our colleagues. And I had a friend who did this in linguistics and he would put a stamp on every paper when he gave drafts around. It said, this does not represent my current position. No matter what I'm saying now, this is not the final answer. I'm going to change it. This guy really understood what is happening. So when you see a mistake in your work and you change your mind, you're in good company. We all do this. Here's Ernest Hemingway. Again, I've gotten a lot of ideas from Hemingway. Rereading, very important. I rise at first light and I start by rereading and editing everything I've written to the point I left off. And when you do that, you sometimes come up with new ideas. I'm really coming to the big point, so don't go away. Secret number six, all people who are experts on writing advise us to do this. Delay editing. The draft you are working on now will not be the final draft. You're gonna make change. Don't edit. Edit means changing punctuation, changing spelling, making a change in grammar, not ideas. That's revision. But don't edit while you're writing. Wait till you're on your final version. You think this is gonna be it? Then you can correct the spelling. The analogy, you don't put on your makeup before you take your shower. You wait, you're out of the shower and you're all clean. Then you put on your makeup. That's the final editing. I would never put on my makeup before my shower, okay? Okay, number seven is the big one, ladies and gentlemen. This is it. Incubation. This is the most important point I'm making. Here is Graham Wallace, 1926. I was at the University of Texas uh, giving a talk and as for a break, I was preparing it. I went to the library and started just browsing the shelves. In those days, you could do that before everything was digital. And I found a book by Graham Wallace called The Art of Thought. I Xeroxed every page. It was so good. I got all these nickels and dimes. Uh, we don't do that anymore, but those days. And he had a theory of problem solving, which I think is true. He says, you rewrite out your ideas, then you need an interval free of conscious thought. You let your subconscious mind take over. And that's where your problems are solved. It allows the free working of the subconscious mind. This is not my idea. This is Graham Wallace in 1926. Boy, did he come up with a good one. Toll, all true artists, whether they know it or not, create from a place of no mind, from inner stillness. Breakthroughs come at a time of mental quietude. Oh boy. Here's my favorite, Poincaré. Let me tell you about Poincaré. Poincaré was a mathematician who worked about 100 years ago. <clears throat> And uh, he worked in non-Euclidean geometry and his work was extremely important for Einstein's theory of relativity. In fact, the word then was that Poincaré deserved the Nobel prize for his work in math. Actually, Einstein did not get the Nobel prize for relativity. He got it for something else, the photoelectric effect, et cetera. But be it as his may, Poincaré was incredibly important. Every collection I have of articles about creativity has the same essay by Poincaré, which has helped me enormously, and I hope it will help you. Poincaré says, when I'm sitting doing my math, and I, and I encounter a problem, which happens all the time, everybody, I then get up from the desk and do something mindless. In his case, I put some wood on the fire. Then I go back to the problem and it's a little bit clearer each time I do that. He says, <clears throat> I make sure it's something mindless. I don't do anything creative. Uh, I do this too. I'll give you what I do. Uh, I wash a few dishes. Uh, I wash like three, four dishes and then go back to my work. Or I clean up the office a little bit. 
back in the old days, um, I'll tell my grandchildren about this. We used to travel and stay in hotels. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. Now everything is all, you know, long distance and remote. But what I would do in the hotel, uh, you know, where the where the uh, presentations were, the first thing I would do was take out my computer and open it up and start work. Within two minutes, three minutes, I find a writer's block. Me too, folks, everybody. I then get up, take my suitcase, put it on the bed, open it, take out one shirt and hang it up, go back to work. That's, it only takes two minutes or so, even less to take these breaks. The subconscious mind then goes to work. I go back to my desk, just like Poincaré, Everything is a little bit clearer. At the end of the evening, I have made progress on my paper and the hotel room is clean. I have put away everything in my suitcase. It won't get wrinkled, okay? Uh, we're always afraid in those days when the person comes in to clean your room, they, you don't wanna give them a big mess. You don't wanna be embarrassed. So I do that too, um, et cetera. This is it. This is the important, most important part short breaks, doing something completely different. I know what doesn't work. What doesn't work is to work on another paper during the break, because that's the subconscious, the subconscious mind should be working on this. The inauthentic labor that we do all day long, the work that we hate, washing dishes, cleaning my office, filing papers, all this stuff, that is a gift. That is time we should be incubating I welcome those breaks now and I no longer complain. I welcome when the kitchen is full of dirty dishes. I'm the one who does it. I don't want anybody else in the kitchen when I'm doing it, okay? Because it's for me to incubate and I don't do a life, a lot of brain stuff. I do ordinary things. Okay, we're getting to, that's the big insight. Here's the big application. We're gonna, I'm gonna quote some famous writers. We'll see what they do. Stephen King, uh, as you may know, Stephen King is a very successful fiction writer. He's absolutely brilliant. And here's what he says. Don't wait for the muse. Don't wait for the creative spirit to come visit you. Your job is to make sure the muse knows where you're gonna be every day from nine till noon or seven till three then the creative spirit will come and visit you. I promise this works. This happens during writing. Now, going back to my adventures in the synagogue, gee, what am I gonna do next year for the play? What am I gonna base it on? They really wanna know. Let me go for a walk, right? That never works. Going for a walk only works if I have a notebook with me and I can jot down ideas as they come. <clears throat> or waiting for the creative spirit random times, do it while you're writing. I'm gonna come up with a new definition of writing, by the way, the composing process. Madeline Langle, Swiftly Tilting Planet, wonderful science fiction writer, directed young people. Inspiration usually comes during work rather than before it. Wow. Do your work, have a writer's block, get up, incubate, come back to work. That is the secret of writing. Welcome the writer's blocks. They mean they're there to help you and show you you're about to learn something new. Wallace Stevens, poet, poet. He does it while walking, but look what he does. He carries slips of paper in his pocket and puts down ideas and notes as they occur to him. I cannot leave the house without a small notebook. I have notebooks with me. Everywhere we went shopping yesterday, my wife and I, and I had my notebook with me. You never know when it's going to hit. They tell the story. This is in Graham Wallace. So the man who had a brilliant idea, he sank to his knees to thank God and got up and had forgotten it completely. You've got to write it down or it's going to disappear. You guys all know about this. All right. Okay. Other secrets. Secret number nine. Okay. Our last secret of this part. Daily, regular writing. Oh boy. Um, I learned about this from Irving Wallace. Irving Wallace is a novelist and a biographer, and he's very good. 
he got interested in how good writers write and interviewed writers and wrote a paper with it, co-authored with a psychologist. <clears throat> it was very good. Most of the writers, he said, keep some semblance of regular daily hours. It's a job. They come to work and they go to work like a job. They do it at different times. A Michael Chabon, a novelist, from 10 p.m. till 4 a.m., my kind of guy, night person, okay? Maya Angelou, brilliant creative writer. She rented a hotel room near her house. Great if you could afford it. And she went to the hotel room for peace and quiet and worked there all morning, regular time. Some people don't have regular hours. They just do a certain amount of time every day, okay? You know, two hours, 20 minutes, half an hour. Some people were page counters. I'm gonna do 10 pages a day. Some people word counters. Doesn't matter, they all work. I'll tell you what I do, but let me warn you, what I do works for me. That doesn't mean it'll work for you. You have to find your own rhythm. When I'm working on a big project, which is all the time, um, it's my quota is always, and I don't know where I got this number, 600 words. I like to produce 600 words, whether they're good or bad, et cetera. If I do <clears throat> 590, I feel incomplete. If I do 605, I'm getting stale. It's not working anymore, et cetera. So that's where I got the idea. But it's daily, regular writing, whichever of these systems you like or your own system. Wonderful research supporting this. A guy named Robert Boyce. I'd love to meet this guy. Robert Boyce uh, is or was a professor at New York State University. And he was in the counseling department. Isn't that interesting? And he would counsel professors, mostly junior professors, beginning professors. If you're a professor, you have gone through this, okay? Or you will in the future. Excuse me. You say in Arabic, l'chaim. Anyway, uh, you have, you have gone, gone through this. You are reviewed for tenure. In the United States, the system is after you start working, uh, after six years, five years, you hand in a list of your publications and you're either kept and you have a lifetime appointment or you're fired and you're humiliated. It's a very scary system. <coughs> Actually, I have to give you an important footnote. The tenure decision is officially based on three things. How much you publish, what you publish, your teaching, and what's called service committee work. But the one that counts is research. Everybody knows that. Well, they don't say that, but it's true. Uh, if you do bad research, no matter how much you teach and how much service, you will not get tenure, okay? If your teaching is horrible, you will get in trouble. But if your teaching is just okay, you'll be all right. Service, if you just do enough, you will survive. If you do too much, people wonder why you have so much free time to do that. So your writing is what counts. Well, Boyce counseled beginning professors who were preparing for the tenure decision. I remember it, man. It was really scary. Uh, he found they were kind of divided, naturally divided into two groups. One group was what were called binge writers, B-I-N-G-E. That's a word that comes from dieting. Uh, we go on a diet, but we allow ourselves to binge. Like I'm going to lose weight and I'm going to stay away from sugar and all this stuff. But on Saturday night, we're going out for ice cream <laughs> and I'm going to have three scoops of vanilla and chocolate ice cream. Okay. This is binging. All right. You allow yourself to break your own rules. The binge writers had this idea. They would do all their writing at once. They didn't do a little bit each day they waited until the conditions were perfect. I can't write unless I have complete peace and quiet. I can't write for 30 minutes a day, 40 minutes. I need to write all day long, five hours, no introduction, okay? Well, you know what happens. Oh yeah, I must have complete peace and quiet. No traffic, no airplanes flying overhead. You have to call the airport, tell them to redirect traffic, et cetera. 
It has to be perfect. Well, you know the answer. The perfect time never came. Very rare when you have five hours and complete peace and quiet. You know that's not going to happen. It's a fantasy. But if it does happen, and I've tried it, and this has happened to me, you lose your place. You don't know where you are. It's like having a big ball of string and you can't find the end. I need to write every day, otherwise I lose my place. I don't know what I'm working on anymore. So you sit down and you forgot completely because you haven't written in a couple of weeks or days even, and you have to start all over again. It doesn't work. The people who did binge writing did not get tenure. They failed. The ones who succeeded were the daily regular writers. It didn't matter how much they read as long as it was every day. It could be 30 minutes a day. It could be two hours a day. It could be 300 words, 1,000 words, one page, 10 pages. As long as they had a regular schedule, they were okay. Charles Dickens, what a great quote. He said he needed a week of hard slog. If he missed one day of writing, he needed a week of hard slog to get back into the flow. Same with me. If I miss one day, it's hard to find my place. And the same thing has happened to you, okay? This has to be daily. Oh, here's something else that happens to me. Um, if I do my daily regular writing, which I do 99% of the time, the world conspires to help me. Like if I do daily regular writing, the ideas are in my subconscious, just below my level of awareness. They're there because I've been working on them. Uh, like yesterday, my wife and I went shopping. We went to the supermarket and I saw something on the shelf and it stimulated an idea, just a wild connection. I wrote it down because it was there or you overhear someone say something and it has to do with what you're working on and you write it down. Daily regular writing keeps the ideas moving around in your subconscious mind. Here is my conclusion, my new definition of the composing process. You write, a writer's block comes, you take a break, you incubate, you go back and write some more. Repeat, 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 repeat. The true writing process is write, have a block, incubate, get part of the solution, write some more. That's me all day long. My life is one writer's block after another, but I have learned to be happy when I have a writer's block. Can you believe that? This is great therapy. It's been great for me because it, when you have a writer's block, it means you're about to discover something new. Okay, secrets of publishing papers. How do you do that? Uh, I think I'm the world champion of publishing papers, okay? I've been averaging about 10 a year uh, in the last 50 years, okay? So that's where you get the 500 part. And I'll give you some more of the secrets though. So I simply, I've done this a lot and these secrets are absolutely right, uh, no question. The first one, Peter Elbow. <clears throat> This one I discovered only a couple of months ago, looking at elbow stuff, and already it's helped me and helped me. What we usually do, let's say you're, I'm gonna write a paper, I'm gonna write a paper on spelling. Okay, so what you do is you look at all the research on spelling and you read it all. No, that'll just confuse you, too much stuff there. Write down your ideas first before you start reading. Just a rough, you know it's gonna be wrong, it doesn't matter but get an idea of where you're going first. Peter Elbow has been such a help, let me tell you. Here's what he says. It's easier to write now when you know less. If you start reading what all these experts say, you're so confused, you don't know what you're doing anymore. After you've written a rough idea of what you think might be the answer, then read. Then see if other people were just as smart as you. See if they came up with the same ideas you did, okay? See if they did it. Uh, I, I've written a, a number of letters to the editor this week and I did that with each one of them. I wrote my ideas first, then I started to check the literature. Secret number two, when you read, 
read narrowly. Read only what you need to read for the paper you're writing now. Read nothing else. Don't try to keep up with the literature. We have been damaged by our teachers. Our teachers tell us to read everything. It might be on the test. Don't worry about it. Read what you need to read. If I'm working on a paper, let's say about spelling, I read only stuff on spelling. That's all. Uh, I got this from a scientist named Bazerman who, who looked at physicists and their habits in reading the literature. Uh, when a new article came in, if it had to do with what they were working on, they read it. Otherwise, they put it aside. They didn't. Uh, I'll read that later when I work on another topic. Don't read everything. Don't worry. Be tested on it. You don't need to know it now. Make it later. Okay, now the actual writing, I have another hypothesis for you. This is called the central table hypothesis. My hypothesis is that every, every empirical paper, every paper that has numbers in it and some kind of statistical analysis has one crucial central table that tells the whole story. I kind of discovered this by accident. I realized when I was browsing <coughs> and I wanted to get an idea of what a paper was about, I found myself looking for the one table. Let's say you're gonna do a study and you're gonna do a study on the effects of caffeine on writing fluency, okay? You know what the answer is gonna be. And you have two groups and they, they're similar except that neither of them are caffeine drinkers especially. One of them is asked to drink two, three cups of coffee while they're working, the other isn't. Then you see how many words they write. So there's an experimental group, a control group. What you're gonna have at the end is a table. You're gonna have a table with the mean number that one group did, the mean number the others did, standard deviation, and then some kind of comparison, like a T-test -test analysis of variance or whatever you're gonna use. That's the one you look for. That's the one you put together first. Now, if you're not doing an empirical uh, paper, you're doing an idea paper, get the main idea down first. That's the central table. Get the major hypothesis first. I'm working on a paper now about creativity. And I'm trying to get that central idea first before I move on. When I get that, it's gonna be easy to write. Okay, going back to empirical research, you do the central table, then you do the other tables. All the tables, how many subjects, how old were they, how old were they, all the things that count. Then you write the results. The first section you write is the results. In non-empirical papers, discussion papers, the first section you write is your idea and you give the details. That's what counts. Then the procedure, you know, if you've read empirical papers, you know it's the introduction, procedure, results, discussion. No, the procedure comes right away. The tables come first, then the procedure. Then when you've got all the data down clear, you can do the conclusion. Notice we haven't done the introduction yet. You do the conclusion. Conclusions are always the same way. Uh, the first part of the conclusion is a short summary, good idea. Then there's a section I call apologies, where the researcher tells you everything, everything that's been done wrong, <laughs> all the mistakes he's made or she's made, okay? Uh, I do that, but I keep it short. Nobody cares. Then the implications. Keep it short. Don't publish your entire dissertation. Nobody wants to read all the details. And then what should be done next? That's the shortest part. We waste so much time in papers telling people how to lead their lives. We should do this, we should do... No, someone's reading your paper. They'll know this already. Um, one of the most important papers ever published, Crick and Watson, who's on the double helix. That's the structure of DNA, you know, those, the spiral symbol, very famous. Uh, they discovered that. They wrote this paper published in the journal Nature, which I found and I was able to download for free, which was great. It was two pages. If you remember half of your secondary school biology, you could understand the paper. It was that clear. Here was the, the section, the discussion section, okay? Very simple. 
It has not escaped our notice the specific pairing we have postulated suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. That was it. They didn't go into details. If you don't understand that, you shouldn't be reading the paper. Okay. So keep it short, keep it simple. When it's all over, then the introduction. Only put things in the introduction that are necessary to understand the paper. Okay, secret number four. We are told in writing, you should consider your audience. Remember that, the teachers tell you? See who you're writing for, make sure it's right for them. My suggestion, don't do that. Forget the audience. Write the paper you want to write. The ideas that are important to you. When you're finished, then you can decide who the audience is. The paper will tell you who the audience is. Oh, this would be good for this journal. This would be good for this magazine, et cetera. Delay audience until you're nearly done. Oh, this has worked for me. This has been a very useful suggestion. Secret number five, expect rejection. Oh gosh, something you don't know. Everybody gets rejected. Not everybody talks about it. Most of my work is rejected. Most of everybody's work is rejected. The American Psych Psychological Association, three quarters of published papers are rejected. Heck, there was a study of the most famous papers in psychology and they found all of them were rejected at least once. They eventually found a home, a place to do it. This is normal. Important papers eventually get published. Uh, let me jump ahead and tell you what to do when you get rejected and give you a little more of my statistics. Uh, I, write, I write a lot of letters to the editor. It's very helpful. It really helps me think clearly and uh, get things compact so you can easily communicate with people. I think in my career, if I average about two, three a month, oh, I've written at least over a thousand. I, I wrote two of them yesterday, okay? The average newspaper acceptance, you write a letter to a newspaper, about 5% are accepted. The New York Times, 1%. My average is about 10% which means I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing much better than average, but I get rejected too all the time. Accept it, realize it's a fact of life. And what you do when you get rejected, I'll give you some clear advice. I'll tell you what I do. Don't delay. Look at the rejection. If it's rejected and they don't give a reason, okay, go on, get, find another place for it. But if they give reasons, Here's why you're wrong. Here's why you're so stupid. Here's why we won't publish your paper. Look at what the critics say. If they say something right, make the change. If they say something you disagree with, don't make any changes. Don't ever change anything that you disagree with because a reviewer told you to. It's not worth it. The paper will come out with your name on it, but not your ideas. You can't say, oh, the reviewer made me do it. No. If you disagree, forget it, find another place to publish it. This is, and do this right away. This, I liked when I get um, criticism of my work, which is all the time, right away, immediately. I have a lot of respect for reviewers. I think we have a very good system in science because I do this too. I review papers for journals. And I realized that uh, the people who do it, it is uh, an act of truly giving. You don't get paid for it. It's something we do to help our colleagues in the profession. So I respect reviewers. Uh, I have changed my policy on reviewing. I'll, I'll tell you that in a little while, what, it's, what it is. But I do it and I accept it and I admire the people who do it and I thank them for it. But you don't have to accept everything they say. Very important. Okay, secret number six, live in the past. The kind of research we are trained to do is what's called primary research. And I'm talking now about experimental research, experiments. You do a study, you do a questionnaire, you survey people, or you do experimental group, comparison group, all that stuff. This is called primary research. It's not the only way. It's not the only game in town. There are other kinds of research 
which I find to be much more exciting. One of them is called secondary analysis. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about one secondary analysis I did with a student who was so interesting. Um, I found some papers in the library published in 1897 and 1902, okay? They were about spelling, the impact of instruction on spelling. And what the, both of these authors did was present their all of their data, what the scores were on tests for many, many students. It was wonderful. Now, in those days, 1900, over 100 years ago, 120 years ago, they didn't have the tests that we have today to do statistics. They didn't have what we call t-tests. They didn't have correlational tests, analysis of variance, multiple regression. All this was invented starting in the 1920s. So my student, Howard White, and I took this old data and we put it through the computers. And guess what? The authors were right. What they said was absolutely correct. The, we found statistical analyses that confirmed what they said. We published that. We honored the work of the past. As you see, we put the, the original author's name in the title. We honored their work, gave them full credit and said, we have just confirmed that you're right, okay? Maybe it wouldn't come out this way. This is a noble thing to do in my opinion, and it counts. It counts as real, real analysis. So I would look for old data. I would do secondary analysis whenever you can. Honor the work of the past. There's also another way of doing it. It's called meta-analysis. This is extremely exciting. In meta-analysis, you take all the research studies. This has been done in bilingual education with great results. A number of people have done it. They, they would take one study, one group got bilingual ed, the other didn't, saw which group was better. And they assigned a number to the statistic. It's called an effect size. How much better was one group than the other? They found 20 papers that did it. They combined them all into one giant analysis, listed all the studies to see what the average effect of bilingual education was. This is beautiful. I have tried this. I've done it in a few st studies. I have found people who've done this, these studies have been wonderful. So there's not just doing your own study. That's okay. There's also secondary analysis. There's also a meta-analysis and we can make rapid results this way and honor the work of our colleagues. Secret number seven, this is a lot of fun. It's called unobtrusive measures. How to do research without bothering people without having to take their time. There was a book on this called Unobtrusive Measures in the Behavioral Sciences. Oh, when I read it in the 1980s, I read it like a novel. I thought it was so interesting. They gave a lot of good examples. One example, there was an automobile dealer in the Midwest in Chicago who was, had a, who was selling Chevrolets, American cars. And he wanted to know where to advertise his automobile dealership. He would do it on the radio, obviously. Which radio stations? How do you find out? Well, you can, you know, uh, send out questionnaires, and do all this stuff, do primary analysis. He found a very clever way. Now, in his store where he sold Chevrolets, there was a repair shop where people could bring their Chevrolets in, <clears throat> and these mechanics would fix things. He asked the mechanics when they brought when they worked on a car to look at the radio and see where the radio dial was set. And he found out which station Chevrolet drivers listened to. This is a wonderful example of an unobtrusive measure. Uh, one of my colleagues did it, Nishan Ashtari, a very clever study. Uh, her research topic was whether people read books in what's called the heritage language. Uh, the heritage language she dealt with was Farsi, sometimes called Persian. And in the Los Angeles area, there is a very large uh, Persian population, uh, something like 200,000 people all in the same area. So she was curious to know if there were books available for people to read in their heritage language. She went to some of the major libraries. She took and she found on the shelf 
books that were written in Farsi. There weren't that many of them, she, which is already an interesting result. She took them down from the shelf and she looked at the books to see where the pages were creased, where there were marks showing that people had read it. Not just pencil, pencil marks, but pages that were folded, were folded down, um, et cetera. This had been done before in a very reliable method. She found the average person who picked up one of these books read about five pages, and then they gave up because nearly all the books were self-help grammar books, and people are not too interested in studying grammar. If it had been a good storybook, it might have been different, but that's a good idea of what we call a wear and tear study, an unobtrusive measure. Okay, we're jumping to secret number nine because I've done number eight already. Beware of infatuation. We all know what infatuation is. It's falling in love. Beware of falling in love. Here's what happens to me. Here's what happens to you. You're doing your research, minding your own business, and you come across an article about a different area of research. And it's interesting. I want to know more about this. I've recently gotten interested in dogs and their relationship to people because uh, our daughter, her family have a dog now. And the dog is just in love with my daughter, her husband, my grandchildren. She follows them around. She can't wait till they wake up in the morning. What is going on with dogs? And there's this hypothesis that dogs know when their masters are on the way home, even if they're 200 miles away, okay? So I got interested in this. I started reading about it. And I thought, wait, wait a minute, this is not what I'm working on. I'm infatuated, but I've got to calm down, all right? I've got to go back to my work, what's important to me now. So I do read that stuff sometimes for entertainment. Oh, is there life after death? All these fascinating things. But stay with your work. Be careful. Uh, Keith Simonton, wonderful philosopher of science, the more successful psychologist, which is true in any field, is one whose research program seems to concentrate on a well-defined set of interrelated topics rather than spreading out too thin. Be careful. Progress is characterized by a natural development from one group of ideas to another instead of flitting from interest to interest in an inconsequential manner. Okay, so stay with your topic. Make sure what you're working on is related to your past work. If you get an idea that's overwhelming and you're completely in love, write it down, file it. You can come back to it later, but stay with the topic that you're on. And that takes discipline, I know. Well, it's now time for questions and I am going to ask and answer the first question to make sure that it gets asked because I think this is a big one. Uh, Aaron, is that okay? If I ask and answer the first question, good, okay. The first question is this. You've been working on this for 50 years, 45 years actually, uh, but nobody's doing it. <laughs> so many language classes today are based on grammar, okay? Uh, people don't follow this advice that you've just given on writing. We do it all wrong, etc. cetera. Uh, when, why is this taking so long and how are we going to change it? Uh, good question, and I'm glad you asked. Here's my answer. Uh, first of all, if you want to find out about comprehensible input and the power of reading and revision, we've talked about, how do you find out? It's, this is hidden knowledge. That's why I call this secrets. It's also secrets of language acquisition. Very few people know about comprehensible input. So my the reason for it is it's hard to find. It's in books and journals. The books are, number one, expensive. <clears throat> the journals are expensive. If you subscribe to journals, most of them cost a lot of money. It, talking in terms of American dollars, a journal subscription can easily cost $50. So I've, I saw one today for 250. I don't know who can afford this, 
This means the only people who can keep up with the journals and the new books, which are very expensive, are people who are currently professors at first-class universities with first-class libraries that have privileges in the library where you can take things out for free and get them Xerox for free. Very few of us are in that position. So we must find a way of getting this done for free. My view, right now we're facing the COVID crisis. The US government has made vaccinations available for free. We have all gotten vaccinations and booster inoculations for COVID for free because it's for the common good. The same thing, my feeling is scientific knowledge should be available for free. It should be freely available all the time, everywhere. The answer to this is what is called open access. That's today's vocabulary word. If we don't do open access, it's the end of our work. It all disappears because I cannot keep up with the research anymore. My colleagues can't because I can't afford the journals. I can't afford the books. Nobody can. I'm retired. I don't have library privileges anymore. Same thing. It, and I, this is now real. And it's true of everyone who is not currently a professor at a big university. Open access, open access. I only submit articles to open access journals. And I have made my work available. When I write a new paper, I put it on my website and I invite people to download it for free. My website is sdcrashen.com, D for David. You are free to download my papers and several of my books and share them with anyone you like except Donald Trump. I don't do anything with him, okay? But that, that's the name of the game. And that's what my colleagues are doing. I think we have no choice. If we don't do this, we cannot communicate with the profession. We have no other possibility. Okay, that's one reason it's not well known because nobody can afford it. Number two, papers are too long. I can't read them, I don't have time. Even if I look at papers that are friendly to me, I don't have time to read them. People write these long, long papers. Keep it short. Keep everything short. Say what you want to say. My policy on reviewing changed about five years ago. Uh, again, I think reviewing papers as a scholar is an obligation. I'm happy to do it. But about five years ago, I, I said, I will no longer review papers that are longer than five pages. Since then, I have not reviewed a single paper. All the papers they send to me are 15, 20, 25 pages. And they don't tell you what they're doing until you're up to page 10, okay? This must change. There is no reason for it, except trying to impress other people. Um, here's a wonderful quote. When we ask the time, we don't wanna know how watches are constructed. You don't have to tell everybody everything, simply state your piece. Number three, write clearly. The papers that we see now are filled with what Chris Hedges calls tortured prose. Our colleagues make them so hard to read. I have the same problem you do. I can't get through these things. I don't know what they're talking about most of the time, and they're too long. Here is Chris Hedges. Here's why they do it. They do it so they won't be criticized because no one understands them. As long as academics write in the tortured vocabulary of specialization of seminars and conferences where they're unable to influence public debate because no one's going to read it, they're free to espouse bizarre or radical theory. The journals are filled with incomprehensible gibberish. The papers might be excellent. I will not know because I don't understand them. Okay. So my three recommendations to solve this problem, make stuff available for free make them shorter and make them clear. The reason people publish in the, I'm, I'm attacking the prestige journals, okay? The reason they do that is that uh, we feel you must publish in these journals, otherwise you won't get hired and you won't get promoted because the committees want you to publish in the journals that are important, which I've stopped doing. People like me 
who are retired, who are already, or full professor, we are the ones who have to do this. If we do this, the profession change is difficult for junior professors to do it. They need to get promotion, they need to get jobs, et cetera. So I'm talking now to the senior professor. We must do this or it is the end of our profession. Okay, on this depressing note, I will stop here and ask if there are any other questions now that I've answered the big one. Thank you so much, Dr. Krashen. It was really comprehensive. The two sets of secrets that you've shared are, no, we're really overwhelmed and it's really helpful despite of the challenges that we're facing. And now may I please call two of my colleagues uh, let's have Ms. Juliana and Ms. Paulina for the Q&A, please. Definitely. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good day, everyone. This is the time for the brief open forum. Ms. Paulina and I, Juliana, will be interacting with you and the audience. So it's a pleasure for us to meet you today, Dr. Krashen. We have received meaningful input from you today as all the days we read your writings. Dr. Krashen, we have got some questions for you from our audience today. So we got room for at least three of them. And the first one is, is it acceptable to publish about six different articles in the same journal? What do you think about it? I hope so. I hope so. Some of the great scholars <coughs> have published several articles in the same journal all at once. That's up to the journals, but the journals have to loosen up. They have to be a little bit more flexible. I like it when people publish several articles at once. It's easy for me to find them, but I'm not the editor. So let's 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 do it. Let them reject it, and let's keep trying. All right. Thank you so much for your advice, Miss Paulina. Yes. Uh, understandably, there were questions uh, related to language acquisition or research papers. However, we've chosen different ones. One of them is: Would you say that free journals are truly credible for the readers? I hope so, because it's the only journals I publish in. I refuse to publish in journals that are not freely acceptable, okay? Again, here's the solution. The solution is for senior scholars, old people like me, per full professors, retired people, people with reputations to do this. So I find if say Jim Cummins, uh, one of my heroes in bilingual education, if he publishes in a journal, that gives the journal credibility. This is a very good idea. So I, it's up to our better known senior colleagues to do this, then the world will change. Thank you so All much. Right. And the number three, I think this is general. How many pages should we write for a research paper? What are the requirements for the paper to be accepted in index magazines? Oh, that I don't know because I don't do medical stuff. So my work isn't carried them. It used to be in the old days um, when I was doing brain stuff, that was something else. It's really up to us. Some of the best, some of my papers have been one page. A short article, a short note. We don't expect readers to have background knowledge for reading every paper. If they don't understand the paper, they can look at previous papers. You don't have to repeat everything in every paper. You are not writing a dissertation. You are not writing a term paper. Keep it short and let us force the journals to change. Uh, by the way, I'll give you some sources if you want some places to look. If you look at my work, you can see where I've published, sdcrashen.com. Uh, I recommend the work of my former student, um, Jeff McQuillan. He has a nickname called Backseat Linguist. It's like the person sitting in the back telling you, turn left here, you know, or you're going too backseat fast. Backseat driver. Yeah, like a backseat driver, exactly. Jeff has a number of very short 
brilliant papers. Uh, Jeff McQuillan, my colleague Nushan Ashtari publishes short papers. A number of people do this. So they are, I think, setting a very, very good example. Isn't it wonderful when you get a journal in the mail, when you find it and it's free and there's a paper by someone you know has interesting ideas and it's two pages. Of course, you're gonna read it. But if you find it's 50 pages and it goes on for days, you know, oh God, no, I don't read those anymore. I can't, I don't have time. Like shorter papers, there's no minimum. Great question, glad you asked. Thank you, thank you so much for your recommendations and suggestions. All right, thank I you think so that's much. all for our part. Thank you, uh, Ms. Juliana and Ms. Paulina. And uh, next will be the awarding of the certificate for you, Dr. Krashen, okay? And this will be presented by Dr. Afshin Salahuddin. Doctor? Yeah, hello, good night, good morning, and a good day to everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephen Krashen, for your insightful um, session. You have given us so many tips, like, I really like your tip, like finding extraordinary via ordinary. That was something amazing. Taking short breaks, and you have quoted so many of my favorite people like um, Hemingway and Keats um, and Frost as well. And uh, one other, other thing that really touched me was that inspiration comes during the break. That was also a very good tip. Thank you so much for being with us. And this is the certificate of recognition that is presented to you. And it's Great, indeed, great honor and privilege that we have you, Dr. Stephen Krishan, uh, as the resource speaker during the conference entitled Writing and Publishing Papers, held on 18th December 2021 via Zoom and Facebook Live. And this has been signed by our respected um, president, uh, Dr. Neil Arevalo uh, Alcantara our respected uh, academic director, Dr. Glenn Cortizano, and myself, Ailta General Secretary, Dr. Akshin. Many thanks to you, and we are honored, and we hope to see you again also on this platform. Thanks so much. Okay, very good, my pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Afshin, for the certificate given to Dr. Krashen and for the awarding of certificates to the- Sir MBA Brian, partners. excuse me. Yes, can we Dr. have Dr. our Sorry. photo off first? Uh, yes, doctor. So that we can take much of Dr. Krashen's time so we <laughs> you can have a photo up. Yes, uh, okay. kindly open your cameras, please, so that we could have our photo off with Dr. Krashen. So we have four pages, or four screens, sorry. So let me start with the first screen. So just kindly give your biggest smile because we don't know which page we are. Okay, so first in three, two, one. All right, let me just save it. Okay, let's move to the second screen. Sorry. Second screen, right, in three, two, one, smile. Okay. Let's go with the third screen. In three, two, one, smile. Sorry. And finally, let's go with the fourth screen. In three, two, one, smile. All right, there you go. I've already uh, took the photos, Dr. Cortesano. Okay, and now we will proceed with the awarding of certificates 
to our event partners. Actually, Dr. Krashen, we have uh, different partners for this once in a lifetime event that we had just did with you. Dr. Cortesano. All right, thank you so much. It's good morning here in the Philippines. It's around 3 a.m. Dr. Krashen, it is always our honor to have you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And now we would like to present our certificate of recognition to our event partners. So let me read International English Language Teachers Association. Certificate of recognition is awarded to Laguna State Polytechnic University, Las Banas Campus, College of Teacher Education as the event partner. Signed by the IELTA General Secretary from Pakistan, Dr. Afshin Salahuti. The IELTA Academic Director from the Philippines, yours truly, Dr. Glenn Cortesano and the IELTA president from Peru, Dr. Nir, Neil Arevalo Alcantara. Next certificate of recognition is awarded to, again, International English Language Teachers Association certificate of recognition is awarded to Batanga State University, Pablo Borbon College of Art and Sciences as event partner. Again, signed by the IELTA General Secretary from Pakistan, Dr. Shin Salahuddin, from the Philippines, IELTA Academic Director, Dr. Glenn Cortesano, and IELTA President from Peru, Dr. Neil Arevalo Alcantara. Our next event partner certificate of recognition is awarded to Universidad de Panama as our event partner, signed by the Pakistan, uh, signed by the IELTA General Secretary from Pakistan, Dr. Afshin Salahuddin, IELTA Academic Director from the Philippines, Dr. Glenn Cortesano, IELTA President from Peru, Dr. Neil Arevalo Alcantara. Next, we have National University Laguna. This certificate of recognition is awarded to you as our event partner. Again, signed by the IELTA General Secretary from Pakistan, Dr. Afshin Salahuddin, IELTA Academic Director from the Philippines, Dr. Glenn Cortazano, and IELTA President from Peru, Dr. Neil Arevalo Alcantara. And of course, Certificate of Recognition is awarded to Pedro Rizalio National University as event partner, signed by the IELTA General Secretary from Pakistan, Dr. Afshin Salahuddin, IELTA Director from the Philippines, Dr. Glenn Cortesano, IELTA President from Peru, Dr. Neil Arevalo Alcantara. Right, thank you so much to all of the universities and associations who are our event partners for this webinar collaboration call it webinar collab webinar collaboration with Dr. Stephen Prashe. Sir Brian. Thank you so much, Dr. Cortesano, for the awarding of certificates to the event partners. And for the awarding of certificates to the participants, may I call Ms. Sola for the presentation of the certificate? Mr. Brian, Ms. Sola, lost the connectivity. All right. So uh, let me just uh, read the citation. To all the participants, after answering the certificate, you'll be receiving your certificate of participation for participating in the conference entitled Writing and Publishing Papers, presented by Dr. Stephen Krashen, held on December 18th. 2021 in virtual mode, signed by the IELTA General Secretary from Pakistan, Dr. Afshin Salahuddin, the IELTA Academic Director from the Philippines, Dr. Glenn Cortesano, and the IELTA President from Peru, Dr. Neil Arevalo Alcantara. So make sure participants to take in our survey. And finally, for our closing message, let's have the IELTA President Dr. Neil Arevalo Alcantara from Peru. I think, Brian, you may call Dr. Afshin Salahuddin. All right. Now, where is Dr. Cortesano? Uh, Dr. Salahuddin? Okay. You want me to comment uh, on the overall session? Yes, Dr. Salahuddin, for okay. the closing message. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Krishan, and we are really thankful to all the ambassadors who took up time 
to attend the event. We are thankful to the uh, universities uh, which were in partnership to this event. Really, really thankful to Sir Bryant, um, Dr. Glenn, Dr. Neil, all the ambassadors and participants for attending the event. And it was a wonderful presentation. It has opened up new windows uh, for all of us. And Dr. Krishan, we are very thankful and honored to have you. And uh, we hope that we will have more of, uh, more of Dr. Krishan in future as well. So thank you so much. And it was a pleasure. And although it's also um, 12, um, AM in Pakistan also, um, but still I'm so fresh and energetic like others. <laughs> so that was wonderful, amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much from ILTA International and other ILTA in, um, uh, you know, associations from different countries. We are all really thankful to you for your uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Okay, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Salahuddin. And to all the participants, thank you so much for sharing us your precious time, even if it's too early in the morning or late at night. But still, you are here for our love for this passion that we're doing. And once again, Dr. Crash, and this is the second time that you've raced in this very uh, amazing platform and you never failed us, Dr. Crash, and you are such an inspiration to all the educators, not just English educators, but to all the educators from around the globe. Once again, Doctor, thank you very much. In our native language, maraming salamat po. Great pleasure. And I'm going to go drink some coffee and do my day's work because it's still early in the day. Thank you so much, Doctor. Have a thank wonderful so day, much. Dr. Crasher. Yeah. Enjoy the day. Thank yes, you so thank much. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks so much. All right. <laughs> so I think Sir Ryan are going to stop our live uh, Facebook live sharing, right? Yes, Dr. Cortesano. Right. And of course, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all our participants, right, from the Philippines, of course, and from other countries, um, the ambassadors who are present and your members. Thank you very much. You know, thank you for coming here. And uh, this is our last activity for 2021. See you on January 2022. And see you next year, right? Uh, for all the upcoming activities of the IELTS. I'm sorry for my virtual Caroline. We just had our event actually from 6 p.m. to 8 o'clock. And then I have this one. I waited for, of course, for Dr. Crashing because I am handling the Zoom. All right. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you so much and God bless us all. Thank you, Dr. Cortesano. And uh, good news to all the participants. We will be sharing the discussion that Dr. Krashen has given to us. We will be posting it in the IELTA's uh, main page. Okay, you could download it. And uh, for the website that Dr. Krashen has gave, we have uh, shared it in the chat box. Okay. I think I've uh, removed it. But we will be sharing it in the main page of the IELTA. So once again, thank you. Thank you so much to all the participants. And uh, see you as well in 2022. Uh, can I ask something? Because in the Facebook, uh, in the comments, people are asking what they should write in the key takeaway area. Is there anything like that? Any box like that that they should fill in in the form? Yes, um, there is a space in which they have to uh, give their conclusions. Conclusions only, uh -huh. nothing yes. more. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Paulina. And uh, to all uh, participants who's done with the survey, we respect your time. Okay, it might be too late or too early in the morning. We have uh, 66 responses already. And uh, for those who haven't answered the form, it is still being shared in our chat box. So take this opportunity and uh, have a wonderful day ahead, everyone. 
Yes, goodbye everyone. I'll end this goodbye. meeting. Yeah, bye. Thank you so much, ambassadors and members. Yeah, but I'm going to say, University, National University, thank you so much.